Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful privilege that we have as your children to open up the Bible, to take a look at what your word says, to invite your Holy Spirit to examine our lives and God to respond to you. Lord, we pray today as we look into a very familiar passage in the book of Luke that you would speak to us with um, what we need to hear. May we see this text with fresh eyes. May you help us to be changed because of the time that we've spent with you today. We love you and we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of my favorite parts of being a pastor is getting to do weddings. I love uh, almost everything about a wedding. I love getting to spend time with the bride and groom in preparation for their big day. I love getting to meet the family. I love rehearsal. I really do. It's one of my favorite parts of the wedding weekend and just kind of cutting back with the couple and putting them at ease the night before that they get married. I love um, just the ceremony and watching the bride walk down the aisle and watching her groom's face. There's a pastor that tells a story of a bride who was very nervous. In fact, uh, she got so nervous right before the uh, ceremony was supposed to happen that her father gave her some words of wisdom. She was convinced she couldn't even make it down the aisle. And he said, hey, listen, sweetheart, there's only three things that you need to focus on. If you focus on these three things, you're going to be just fine. The first thing you need to focus on is just walking down that aisle. I know you can do it. Just focus on walking down the aisle of the church. I know it's rather long. I know that there are people that you know that you're a little bit worried about on either side of that aisle, but just focus on getting down the aisle. And next, he says, focus on the altar. It's your destination today. Make your way down the aisle to the altar, and there you will stand before God and the man that you love, and you'll make vows to God and him. Focus on the altar, for the altar represents the love that God has for you in Jesus Christ. I mean, what a wise father. And then he says, okay, lastly, focus on the hymn just before you sign the register. In poetry and song, the hymn embodies the love that God has for you in Christ. The love that he has for your husband and his love for you. So to help you not be nervous, focus on these three, three things. Walking down the aisle, standing before the altar, and listening to the hymn. And you know, it calmed the bride down. She was thankful. She had this kind of peace and calm that came upon her. Her friends and family who had gathered there for her big day just noticed this incredible calm on her as she held her bouquet and she began that bride walk down the aisle. But they were a little confused at what she was mumbling as she was walking down the aisle, remembering those three words, I'll alter him. I'll alter him. I'll alter him. And she did. For the rest of her life, she altered that man. And um, I just wanted to tell that story today. It has nothing to do with our sermon today. But uh, I love that, that story. So have you ever had uh, some tough questions asked to you? You've been on the opposite side of some questions like, where were you on the night of March 24th, 2005? I mean, that's a terrible question. I hope I never have to stand before a judge or a lawyer or a police officer as they ask a question like that. Or maybe uh, you've had this question, what were you thinking? I mean, maybe you've said that to yourself. You've just kind of stood there after doing something that you knew you shouldn't have done. And your only response playing over and over and over again through your head is, what in the world were you thinking? Or maybe it's, um, uh, uh, somebody told me something terrible about you. Is it true? And you're like, oh my goodness, it is true. But I don't want to admit to the fact that it's true. I'm embarrassed by what that represents, but I've been caught. Or maybe you got a little bit proud in your life and you got a little bit too big for your britches and somebody looked at you and they said, who do you think you are? Who in the world do you think that you are to treat me like that? I mean, questions like that immediately put you on the defensive. They immediately feel a little bit awkward. If you're guilty, they certainly make you feel that guilt. And Jesus, to his disciples, in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, asks one of those difficult type of questions. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Can you picture that? Jesus is preaching a sermon. We've been in this sermon for a long time now. Most of Luke 6 is devoted to the sermon that Jesus gives 
to the original 12 who he had called to be his apostles. And primarily, it was a sermon for them. There were some other disciples behind them and a multitude behind them. But he's looking directly at these 12 who he has just called after a night of praying for wisdom about who he would call to be his disciples. And you would think that he's going to have nothing but, you know, just positive words to say to these men whom God has called and set apart to be his disciples. And his question is, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? I wonder how you'd respond to that question if Jesus were here today and you were the one on the other end of that question. Can you imagine sitting with the Lord and having him look at you with those eyes that I am sure can see everything about me, who knows me better than I know myself, and I can try my best to bluff it, but there are times where he will look at us and he will ask us a question and we are stripped basically naked before the Lord in our souls. And we say, ah, yeah, who am I? Who am I? Why do I call him Lord, Lord, and not do what you say? I mean, Jesus gets right to the point in Luke 6, 46. He um, asks his original followers some questions that are difficult for anyone to hear. Now, if you were with us last week, you know that this follows Jesus' teaching on spiritual fruit. We had spent some time last week talking about the fact that Jesus said everybody who's a follower of him is going to be known by the fruit that they produce. And we talked a lot about spiritual fruit and what is it that our lives are producing last week. And at the end of the sermon last week, I asked you to take an inventory and I asked you a number of questions. Questions like, you know, God tells husbands to love their wives as Christ loves the church. And he tells women to love and respect their husbands. How does how you treat your spouse, what does how you treat your spouse tell the world about how you think about Jesus? He said, children, obey your parents is one of those words. Honor your parents, um, love your parents. How does how you treat your parents tell others how you feel about the Lord? And we asked a whole lot of questions like that. And I got to tell you, as your pastor... I was so proud of you this week. I have had more conversations with people from Woodbury Community Church about last week's sermon than probably any sermon that I've ever preached here. And so many of you have been incredibly vulnerable with me, and you've told me, you know what, that inventory that you read last week, I'm struggling with that one on loving my spouse, or I'm struggling with that one on prayer, or I'm struggling with spending time with the Lord, or I'm struggling with honoring my parents, or I'm struggling with any number of things. What I love about it is you didn't just tell me you're struggling with it, but then you began to share with me what you're going to do about it. And I love that because you're showing yourselves to be people who don't just want to listen to the hard words of Jesus and let them roll off your back, but you want to take those words and you want to apply them and you want to change. What is it that your life is producing there are some, according to Luke 6, 46, who will call Jesus Lord, Lord, and not truly be saved. In fact, in the parallel passage in Matthew 7, where Jesus is teaching in a very similar manner at the Sermon on the Mount, he basically tells them that there are going to be some who someday will come to heaven and they will say, Lord, Lord, and he will say, get away from me. I, I never knew you. That's a hard truth. Here it's as if Jesus is saying, don't be a hypocrite. Anyone can call me Lord. Some can even call me Lord, Lord. Meaning, hey, we're really trying to say the right thing about you, Jesus. But if you don't do what he tells you to do, it simply doesn't equate. True disciples are those who live obedient lives. Think back to the inventory again that you took last week. How does the character trait of obedience to Jesus show itself in your life? In verse 46, Jesus gets to the heart of the matter with people who have no problem calling Jesus Lord, but have major issues with allowing him to be Lord. And I suppose this is as good a time as any to ask ourselves the question then, so what does it mean for Jesus to be Lord of my life and not simply my Savior? Some of you can remember a day when after years of going to church, reading your Bible, maybe serving on committees or various roles in your community, you realize that you were just playing religious lip service to God. This authenticity, this following Jesus as Lord in your life was something that wasn't real. It was a game for you. Maybe it was because you grew up in a Christian house and you thought that, you know, I've always been a true follower of Jesus or Maybe it's because you feel so comfortable hanging around other Christians that you've adopted a language and a culture of the church, but never adopted a heart that complies to the demands that Jesus requires of a true disciple. 
Maybe you grew up in the Bible Belt. Cindy and I spent a lot of time in the South in our life, and sometimes in the Bible Belt it feels like Jesus and Christianity is just embedded in culture. Ask people in the Bible Belt sometimes about their relationship with Jesus, and if they know the Lord or if they're a Christian, they say, of course I'm a Christian. I go to church every Sunday. I tithe 10% of my income to the church. I serve my committees. I support missionaries. But talk to them about Jesus as Lord of their lives. And some people, whether you're in the South or the North or in the Eastern Hemisphere or the Western Hemisphere, bristle at it. Is Lordship simply doing all sorts of good things for God, like tithing and serving on committees or going on mission trips? Or is it something more? I began to realize my depravity when I was in college. I'd grown up in a fantastic Christian home. I've shared that with you many times. And at 18 years old, I'd grown to the point in my life where I had done a lot of really good things for Jesus. In my high school, I led our campus Bible study my senior year. I was instrumental in inviting friends to our youth group. 14 of my friends my senior year in high school um, trusted Jesus in our youth ministry. I mean, it was, it was an incredible year of revival there. But in my own life, in my personal life, Jesus being Lord, that wasn't something that I was really willing to allow him to be. God was something I did. He was an add-on in my life. My faith in Jesus Christ was based on a more fear out of going to hell or disappointing my parents or my grandparents than it had to do with what Jesus did for me. My service for Jesus was cultural. My best friends were from church. My family were all professing Christians. Being a Christian was almost expected of me. And some of you know that type of a home. I'm sure I completely, uh, I'm, sh- I'm not sure I completely understood what it meant to be a follower of Jesus until I got to college. I remember going forward in a church service to commit my life wholeheartedly to Jesus my freshman year of college saying, I don't want you to just be my savior. I don't want you to just be fire insurance. I don't want you to just be this this God who saves me from hell if you're not the God who writes my story. If you're not the God who I follow in obedience, if you're not the God who is Lord over everything in my life, my career, my relationships, my, my, my decisions that I make in my life, it was then that I truly understood what it meant to be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. But let me be honest with you. I'm 45 years old. Um... And I'm learning every day a little bit more about what that means. Every single day of my life, God is continuing to teach me what it means to love him with a heart that is more pure and good. For years, I said the right things and I did the right things out of fear. But I want to be somebody who says and does the right things out of love because Jesus is the lover of my soul and he is my greatest desire. I want to be a holy person because I have a heart that is holy in love with Jesus Christ. And I hope that's you too. John Newton has been called the father of evangelicalism. He lived in the 18th century. And when he was preaching on the passage in Matthew where Jesus talks about those who will say, Lord, Lord, and he will say, get away from me. I never knew you. He said this. He says, if I ever reach heaven, I expect to find three wonders there. First, that I will meet some people who I didn't think were going to be there. I think he's right. I think we're going to get to heaven someday and there are going to be some people that we've judged here on earth that we're going to be a little bit surprised to see in heaven. And I hope that in our resurrected selves and when sin gets out of the way that we're going to be so joyful that they're there. Those petty disagreements and arguments and theological differences that sometimes we have here on this side of eternity um, can melt away. Second, he says... I expect to miss some I had thought to meet there. That's heartbreaking. There are going to be some, Jesus tells us, that will say, Jesus, I did all of these things in your name. And he he kind of implicates and, and intimates that these are ministry leaders and pastors and missionaries and elders and leaders in the church who someday are going to go to heaven and he's going to say, get away from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. And that's a heartbreaking and a scary thought. And then Newton, echoing, I think, the Apostle Paul, where Paul says, I am the chiefest of sinners, says, and third, the greatest wonder of all is to find myself there. Billy Graham said that that passage in Matthew is the scariest passage in all of Scripture for him. 
And he's Billy Graham. <laughs> and you, you look at passages like that, and what it requires us to do is what we did last week. It requires us to take inventory of our life. It requires us to do what the New Testament calls working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Are we people who take Jesus seriously in his words? True discipleship isn't lip service to God. It isn't about working your way into heaven. None of us can do that. Some of us think, well, you know, is, 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 is Jesus saying, I just need to do more stuff, and if I do this and 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 do this, but I don't do that, I'm out? No. Us getting to heaven is all about his grace. It is about him and him alone. The scripture says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by the washing of regeneration, by the Spirit's work in us, are, are we saved? In Titus 3, 5, and 7, it says, He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, not because of all those good things, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the, through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Doing things for God is never going to save you. Jesus saves us when we place our trust in him placed based on his grace and his grace alone. But we prove that based upon what we talked about last week by the fruit in our life. And we prove that when we live the life described in verse 47. Look at verse 47. Jesus continues his thought. Everyone who comes to me and hears my word and does them I will show you what he is like. And I probably ought to read you verse 48 and 49 where he shows you what they're like, but I want to hold up on that for a second because there are three really quick lessons on discipleship right here. Number one, a true disciple of Jesus comes to him. Everyone who comes to me. We can't enter into a relationship with God apart from Jesus Christ. He said it himself in John 14, 6, the verse that I have probably read more than any other since becoming your pastor because it is that foundational. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So a true disciple comes to God through Jesus and is continually coming to him. The first disciples were people who came to Jesus. They valued spending time with him. Last week I asked you, when was the last time that you spent time with God in prayer because he's the love of your life? Not because you wanted something from him, but simply because you wanted to spend time with the lover of your soul, the one you adore. And a couple people here in the past week said, that's the one that spoke to me. And you know what they did this week? They bought books on prayer. And they, they talked to their friends. What are some of the books on prayer that have impacted you the most? And they're, they, they're, they're reading these books on prayer together to understand what it means. One of those books is a book called A Praying Life. And I think it's so cool to see God moving in people's lives that way. When we pray, we're spending time with him. It's what disciples do. The first disciples came to Jesus repeatedly. He was their top priority. And he gives us that same invitation, the same invitation he gave to his original disciples. We need to come to him. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Jesus gave us one of the beautiful benefits of coming to him. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You ever met somebody that just their whole life is about like running all around in circles and whenever you talk to them, you say, how are you doing? I'm stressed. I'm so busy. I have this going on, this going on, this going on, this going on. And, and my life's just out of control and they almost wear it as a badge of honor and it's not what a follower of Jesus Christ's life is supposed to be marked by. Come to me, Jesus says, all who labor, all who are busy with working and continually, you know, filling our lives with stuff and you're heavy laden, you have these burdens upon you, you can almost picture it. And I'm going to give you rest. I love it when I'm exhausted and I can crawl into a bed sometimes just take a nap. We've got a trampoline in the back of our house that um, every once in a while when the sun is out and it's beautiful and I'm exhausted, I love pulling onto that trampoline and just laying there and just letting the sun bake me and resting. There's something beautiful about rest. It's refreshing. It's renewing. And it's what Jesus offers to you and what he offers to me. The early church 
40 days after Jesus ascended into heaven, the day of Pentecost came. The Holy Spirit comes upon the Apostle Peter and he preaches the sermon and 3,000 people in one day come to faith in Jesus Christ. And in one of the coolest miracles of all, everybody who was in the crowd that day heard it in their own language. My daughter just graduated with a Spanish education major from college and and I never took Spanish. And so my daughter can speak in our house and say these words that I just don't understand. And she and Cindy or Jeremy can have this conversation. And, and I can be totally out of the conversation because it's a different language. Day of Pentecost, Peter spoke. Everybody heard it in their own language. I mean, that's cool. But here's one of the marks of the early church. The early church was continually coming to Jesus. Now, Jesus had ascended into heaven, but they didn't neglect the gathering of themselves together. They were continually coming together to worship him. Even after Jesus left, they did what you're doing here. I mean, most of Minnesota and Wisconsin would think that all of you are ridiculous today. It is Memorial Day weekend, and you're in God's house with God's people, and that's beautiful. You know what that means? That means you're putting God it's a priority in your life, and maybe you don't have a cabin, too. I don't know, but it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. True disciples come to him, and the way that it is in the Greek is continually come to him. All right, secondly, a true disciple hears his words. It's what Jesus says. He says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he's like. It seems that we live in a world where we're continually bombarded with conflicting messages, so uh, we have a generation of folks who, when I see them, there's headphones over their ears oftentimes, or they're listening to music, and you know what? I don't need the headphones to get distracted. I just have it out of my car radio. And so I get, you know, distracting messages from, or, or conflicting messages to what Jesus gives me on the radio, on television, in media, and advertising, sometimes from my friends and my relationships. And we have messages that are coming to us all the time that are competing for us hearing the words of Jesus. And a true disciple is somebody who is going to listen to Jesus and he's going to listen with understanding. They're going to do everything they can to continually put themselves in a place where they're hearing from Christ. Number three, a true disciple does what Jesus commands. Jesus continues his train of thought by telling them to, to do that. His, his half-brother James put it beautifully in James 1, 22 to 25, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Next, Jesus would give us two examples that show the differences between somebody who applies God's word and the person who doesn't. And he begins with a positive example in verse 48, a verse that many of you are familiar with. Many of you sang these verses as a little song in Sunday school. The wise man built his house upon the rock. You know that song, all right? It says, and he is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and the stream broke against it, that house could not shake it because it had been well built. I love the picture that Jesus gives of a life that is built upon the foundation of the rock. And that rock, in this case, is Jesus Christ. This is where we say to Jesus, hey, Jesus, I want the Jesus Construction Company to take over the construction of my life. I want my life to be built on your blueprints. I want my life to be built on your principles. Jesus, you get me all. You are the one who I'm living for. You are the one who my decisions ought to honor in my life. Have you built your house upon the rock of Jesus Christ? Two people can attend the same church. They can use the same words. They can teach the same classes. They can go on the same mission trips. They can have the same friends. They can pray the same prayers. And one can end up in heaven and one can end up in hell because one builds their life upon the foundation of Jesus Christ and his lordship in their life and one builds it upon something else. A true disciple is one who builds their life in the rock. Let's like, take a look quickly at some characteristics of those who build their house in the rock. We've already heard the first three. They're people who come to Jesus. 
Jesus is priority number one in their life. Number two, they listen to his spirit's voice in their life. Just this past Thursday at the Woodbury Community Church School of Discipleship, we had our last class for this school year. And our students for Thursday had read the book, Jesus Among the Other Gods by Ravi Zacharias. It's this wonderful apologetic of the Christian faith. And we had this incredible class, kind of the last one of the year. We did some role playing and the students had to kind of defend their faith. And how would you defend your faith in this situation? And there were a lot of questions from the students to me to say, well, how would you, you know, what do you do in those situations where you're sharing your faith with somebody who doesn't believe the things that you believe? And we talked about the fact that more than anything else, or I talked about the fact that I need the Holy Spirit's guidance in those moments, in any spiritual conversation that I'm having. And if everything is spiritual, then that's probably every conversation, all right? But those conversations where specifically people are coming to us with questions about Jesus, I need the Spirit to guide me, because it might be different with one person than another. And, you know, so they kind of role-played some situations. There were some fantastic suggestions that some of the students had had from their own interactions with people of different faiths and questions that they'd encountered. School of Discipleship ended at about 7.15 that morning. At about 8.45, the church door opened, and I got to practice what we talked about at the School of Discipleship an hour and a half earlier. Guy walks in off the street to Woodbury Community Church, lives in our neighborhood, and was in an incredible anguish. This guy told me stories that, you know, just kind of made the hair stand up on on my arms. I mean, he has been through horrific things. And he was in absolute anguish. And so I did what I told the students in the school of discipleship you do. I prayed and I said, Father, I need your spirit right now in this place to guide me, to show me what it is that this man needs to hear. And 30 minutes later, that man gave his life to Jesus Christ. He prayed to receive him as his Savior and his Lord. He came and he was just so ready. I mean, just from the get-go, it's one of these things you dream about as a follower of Jesus, to have somebody come to you and basically present the gospel with the questions that they asked. And the agony and the distress and the anxiety that was on that man's face when he walked into my office was gone when he walked out. There were a few people here at church that day who saw him as he came in and saw him as he left and just couldn't believe the transformation. That's what Jesus does in a life. We need to listen to his spirit's voice in those daily conversations that we have. Number three, a follower, somebody who builds their life on the rock, they are doers of the word. They're people um, who, who actually do what it says. Last week I said there's this, this, this new study that's come out as new as two weeks ago that says that today 35% of Americans call themselves born-again Christians. Boy, I wish that was true. I mean, it's true that people do that. But if 35% of the people in our nation were truly followers of Jesus Christ, disciples who were living for him, who were allowing him to be Lord of their life, our country would look very different than it does today. Number four, characteristics of those who build their life upon the rock, they spend time with other Christians. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I have a friend who uh, has struggled with addiction throughout her life. And every time she's struggling with addiction, she makes the mistake of shutting herself off from the Christians in her life and from others who love her. And you know what happens? Normally that addiction takes over and grips her. And then when she humbles herself and recognizes how far she's fallen and puts herself in fellowship and puts herself around the right type of people, gets the help that she needs from treatment, life gets a little bit better for her. We need to spend time with other Christians. Number five, they hide God's word in their heart. Several months ago, I shared a picture with you on here that a friend had posted on this Facebook page, and it was this piece of paper that was just matted and yellow and folded up in multiple pieces, and and, it And this guy treasured this piece of paper. It was a gift that his father had given to him and his brothers. And it was a challenge that their father had given them with a hundred Bible verses on it to memorize those hundred Bible verses before they left for high school. And most of them didn't get it done before high school, and so they tried to get it done before college. And but this guy said, This was the greatest gift my father ever gave me. 
Psalm 119 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By taking heed according to your word. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. I know somebody who's taking this summer to memorize the book of James. My brother Kevin, when he was in college, decided he wanted to memorize the book of Romans, and it transformed his life. Hide God's word in your heart. Number six, they are accountable to others. You know, we can't make it in our Christian life without accountability. James 5.16 tells us to confess our sins one to another. My, um, I have so many friends in life who um, I thank the Lord for. And some of my greatest gifts in life are a group of pastors that I call my band of brothers. My first of the band of brothers has taken a job somewhere else, and he's moving to Florida in the next couple of weeks. And we're, we're mourning him. Because there is this accountability and this love and this, this thing that happens when you share a life together for seven or eight years with somebody. We need to be held accountable. Number seven, they make God's priorities their priorities. Things like discipleship, evangelism, justice, prayer, generosity are the marks of a follower of Jesus. Well, there's another characteristic, and every time I read this characteristic, this is the characteristic of the one who doesn't build their life on the rock. I'm reminded of the vacations of my boyhood. My parents would take us every year to a place in Michigan, to a beautiful beach resort. This is the beach that I grew up going to on Lake Michigan. I loved it. Miles of coastline like that on one side, and then the next slide shows you when you turn around, it just had these kind of beautiful little mini sand dunes that went up to this beautiful forest and it was one of the most idyllic places to grow up going on vacation. And like all people who vacation on beaches, when I was a little kid, I used to love to make sandcastles. I didn't make that sandcastle, all right? I wasn't that good. Uh, although there was these sandcastle competitions that they would have at this, at this family camp. And when our kids were growing up, they would participate in the same deal. We'd make sandcastles. And I remember one of our children, and maybe it was my nephew, and I can't remember which one, um, when the waves came up and destroyed the sandcastle one day, just being distraught over that stupid water that ruined the sandcastle. Sometimes um, that happens, that happens all the time when you build sandcastles. Here's what Jesus says about building your life in the sand. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. When the streams broke out against it, it immediately fell, and ruin of that house was great. In Matthew, he uses the word sand. So here's the characteristics of those who build their house in the sand. Very much opposite of the other. They're self-reliant. And so those who build their house in the rock come to God. These are people who say, you know what? I don't need God. I'm my own man. I'm my own woman. At my funeral, the song that's going to be played is Frank Sinatra's I Did It My Way. It's my life. I'm proud of my life. And I'm going to do and live life the way that I want to live life. I don't need God. I'm relying on me. Guess what? Rely on yourself long enough and nobody's going to let you down as much as yourself. Nobody's going to let you down. All those people in life that sometimes let you down, you're going to let yourself down too. Number two, they don't listen to or recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit. God's word has been drowned out. They tune out completely to spiritual things. Number three, they don't obey the word. When they're exposed to the word or convicted, they choose to ignore it. I know a guy from a former church who was so proud. And he would come to church simply because he wanted to keep the peace in his family. And he wanted to keep peace with his wife and and, and so he'd come to church, but it had nothing to do with him or his desire. And he would come to me at least a couple times a year and say, you know, I'm considering this is the year that I might give my life to Christ. But, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I you know, and then he'd, he'd rationalize and he'd say something like, I want to have more fun for another year or next year he can have me or, you know, I'm doing pretty good. I, I just don't need this Jesus. And and that was kind of how he talked every single day. Some are so proud that even when exposed to the word, they choose to ignore it. Number four, um, these are people who make poor choices and friends. These are people who their closest acquaintances are not people who are ever going to draw them into a recognition of their need for Christ. Now remember, Jesus wants us to hang out with people who don't know him. Jesus was accused of that continually. I know too many Christians who don't have any friends who don't know Jesus. And that's just wrong. God has called us to, to love people in this world and to love them into the kingdom of heaven. 
But here's the deal. Our closest friends ought to be friends who are those Proverbs 27, 17 people who are sharpening us in our faith. Number five, they live unexamined, unchecked lives. So accountability is not the word for them. Instead, it's an unexamined life. It's a life that has nothing to do with allowing and inviting anybody to come in and speak to them about truth. Number six, faith makes no difference in their day-to-day lives. And number seven, when hardship comes, they don't lean into Jesus. They don't lean into Jesus because they've never trusted him in the good times either. So I got a call a couple weeks ago from a member of Woodbury Community Church. Jeff and Patty Gumbuski are an incredible couple. They attend here. They normally sit over there, and, and uh, they've been coming here. But they're, you know, rather shy and private. And Jeff had a major medical issue. Jeff had a, 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 an aortic fissure, and life was in the balance. His kidneys were shutting down. His lungs were shutting down. And his wife, Patty, had called me and asked me for prayer. And then he was in the ICU. She said, can you come on up? I'm worried. At first, she didn't want him on the prayer chain because he's kind of private. And she was like, put it on the prayer chain. Ask anybody in church to pray. Jeff needs your prayers. I, I don't know if he's going to make it. When I got up to Regents Hospital a week ago Thursday, there were seven doctors that were surrounding his bed. And they were telling Patty to prepare herself, that things didn't look good. He had the hiccups. They needed to paralyze him to stop the hiccups in order for his condition to even be treated. And so as I sat there in just the few minutes I had with Patty in that chaotic situation, she said, you know, please ask people to pray and um, pray for me. I'm afraid to hope for too much. I've seen so many of my friends have their faith shaken when something bad happens, but know this, whatever happens, I know that God's got me. I know that God's got it under control. I know that God loves me. And blessed be the name of the Lord. And so we put it on the prayer team chain. And so many of you last week, if you're not part of our prayer team, all you got to do is email the office and we'll get you on that. It's such a privilege to pray for other people. And it's so cool to see God work in miraculous ways sometimes. Jeff, who wasn't expected to make it through the night, had all these people praying for him here and around really the, the, the metro. And not only did he make it through the night, but uh, he made it through the next night. He made it through the next night. He took the intubation tube out. He got his color back. Hiccups never went away. And I get a call from Patty on Tuesday saying, hey, Jeff's feeling good enough for a visit. Can you come up? He wants to talk to you. And so I spent about 45 minutes with Jeff and, and Patty this week because he just shared the, the amazing work that God was doing in, in, in his life and this work of healing and just amazed. Um, and Patty again said, but you know what? God's got us. And if it went the other way, I'm trusting God and I'm loving God. And guess what? I got a call for a text message from Patty on Friday morning. And she says, pray for Jeff. He's back in ICU. There's internal bleeding and he needs prayer. I text her as late as last night. And she, again, um, said, keep praying. He's rallying a little bit here. But you know, Patty and Jeff are people who have built their life upon the rock. And when the storms of life have come their way, they've chosen not to let it destroy them, but to trust the Lord through it. And they're this incredible example. And Jeff definitely needs the prayers of our church today and and just continue to lift him up. Um, There's something so beautiful about that kind of faith. So my question for you as you leave today is really simple. Are you building your life upon the rock? That when the storms come and the winds come and the waves come, your faith can stand. And you can be secure in who has you and who has your future. Or if you built your house on a terrible foundation, on shifting sand, and the storms come and the winds come and they blow wherever they will and your foundation crumbles. Listen, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can do that today. It's as simple as saying, um, praying a prayer to the Lord and saying, Jesus, I want you not as just Savior, but as Lord. I want you, your construction company, you as my contractor, you to come into my life and to change me and to, to, to rearrange me and to rearrange my priorities. I don't want to play these games. 
Maybe today you have to do what I did in college and you have to say and be honest and say, you know, my faith has been a game up to this point in life. It's been about fear of hell. It hasn't been about love for God and what God wants to do in and through me. It hasn't been about saying, Jesus, you get the rule and the reign and the authority in my life. And maybe today it's the day and this Memorial Day weekend when so many are away and you're here to say, Jesus, today I'm giving you all of me. So we're going to pray. And as we do, if you're, if you're there in either one of those two spots where where you've never trusted Christ or you've played games and you're ready to really trust him as Savior and Lord, I want to invite you to pray this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the love that you have for me, that you demonstrated to me in Christ Jesus. Thank you that you offer me a firm foundation. God, you offer to come in and to be the construction company of my life, to be the best contractor, to be the one who comes and and, 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 and lays the blueprints of my life out. God, you've shown me how to live and you've given me principles. And Lord, I've only wanted you up to a point. Today, God, I confess of that. Today, I confess and say, I'm tired of living a life that isn't fully yours. Jesus, today, would you come in and rearrange my life? Would you forgive me of all the sins that I've ever committed? Lord, either for the first time, or, Lord, today I'm praying as one who, who, who prayed a prayer but didn't mean it in the past. And today, for the first time in my life, I'm truly saying to you, God, take all of me. Be my Savior and my Lord. Be the one upon whom the foundation of my life is built. God, give me the courage to live for you in this generation. Give me the discernment to know when your voice is speaking to me and when I need to put aside the voices that I'm hearing from culture that continually say that, that, that you are irrelevant or you don't matter or that, God, you are, you are some, some religion for another time. God, help me to understand that what you want from me is not religious deeds, but what you want from me is me, all of me, giving all of myself to you. Have your way with me, Lord. Jesus, I believe that you went to the cross for my sin. You died for my sin. You rose from the dead for my sin. And today I confess you as Savior and Lord. Have your way in me, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you keep your heads bowed and eyes closed? If you prayed that prayer today, I'd like you simply to make eye contact with me. I'm going to look on my right first, your left. Today you prayed that prayer. You look at me. I want to catch eye contact with you and pray for you. Awesome. Look to my left. Anybody over here? Look today. See, that's me. Today I'm ready to give Jesus all of me. All right. Praise God. God's done some good things here today. We're going to sing one song and close together.